Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes. So welcome to this session for Plant Taxonomy and Systematics. My name is Maria Jackson from Free State University, um, Department of Plant Sciences. And we have five presenters in the session this afternoon. Um, so our first presenter is Abdul Wakil, uh, Abdua, Ajau, sorry. So um, whenever you're ready, please uh, just share your screen with us and then you can continue. My screen is going to be shared by Angela. I think that was the agreement. Okay, I don't see any presentation yet. Okay, maybe I can still share my screen then. Let me try and share then. Okay. So I'll just let you know when we can see it then. Can you see my screen now? Yes, it's perfect. So you can continue. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk on systematic of Southern Africa species of Wincosia in the family Fabiaceae. Wincosia belongs to the third largest family of flowering plants in the tribe Fasioli. There are about 79 of them in Southern Africa. Why about its first, its first species of in South Africa? In terms of their distribution, they are found in, in Southern Africa and some part of Africa and America, as well as Asia. In South Africa, they are found in all the six provinces. Why some species have a restricted distribution? Why some other species might be found in, 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 in all the provinces? For example, in Kosia Kalibaya, that is found all over South Africa. Why species like in Kosia Pen? like we have some poor uh, connectivity issues for Abdul Akil. Um, Yeah. <laughs> 
Hi, Sorry to interrupt you. Adao, can you hear me? Hi, sorry to interrupt you. Um, my team is going to share screen on your behalf because um, we think that the connectivity is a bit poor. So stop sharing on your behalf and we will um, post the slides on the screen for you. Because we really are struggling to hear you. We've now displayed your slides. So if you can just talk to the slides and let us know when to proceed, this might help with your connection. Abdul Wakil, can you still hear us? Um, we can't hear you anymore. Okay, seems like we've lost an Angela. Um, can we maybe move on to the next presenter until his yes. connection is sorted out again? Sure, no problem. You can proceed. Um, okay. So next up, we have uh, Nicola Burke presenting the phylogeny of the Southern African marigolds. So um, thank you, Nicola. We may proceed. Thanks very much, Mariette. Um, please let me know as soon as you can see my slides. There you go. We can see it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, taxonomic um, work on the Bitu tribe, Kalenjali, in the Daisy family. Um, and just to orange you, this family, also known as Asteraceae or Compositae, uh, is a very large family, and all members are characterized by their flowers being reduced in size and arranged in a particular inflorescence called a capitulum. And the flowers are usually differentiated into central disc um, flowers. Um, the, the, these flowers are small and tubular, and they cover the entire central flattened receptacle. You can see in this um, cross section here, um, these are the disc flowers, the fruits are developing, and these are the corolla tubes. And then ray flowers, which are arranged in a single ring around the outside, around the periphery here. And you can see the ray flower here, also the developing fruit, there's the corolla tube. And then the corolla lobes are extended on one side of the flower into this long structure called a ray. So that the whole thing, um, sorry, the whole thing um, mimics a single simple flower. So tribes in the daisy family are normally of the order of hundreds to thousands of species in size. Um, Calendula is one of the smallest tribes in the family with only about 130 species. Um, they're commonly known as the African marigolds or the bitus. Um, and growth forms are annual or perennial herbs or woody shrubs. And morphologically, the tribe is characterized by a leaf-like involucre. So the involucre is the row of bracts or the arrangement of bracts that surround and protect the flowers. In calendula, they are leaf-like and they're arranged in one or two or sometimes three rows. And the other morphological feature that characterizes the tribe is that there's no pappus. So the pappus is the modified calyx um, that's normally involved in fruit dispersal. Um, and here you can see typical papa structures from other Asteraceae tribes, but in Kalenjali, these are absent. So the, um, the, the floret lacks the papas. And perhaps for this reason, the tribe exhibits great variation in fruit structure. And I'll demonstrate this. I'm going to just walk you through the variation in the tribe. So um, first off, the genus Garyleum, comprising eight species. In Garyleum, only the ray flowers produce fruit. So you can see in this developing um, fruiting head, or actually develop, these look fruits look ripe. 
only the outer ring of flowers has produced fruit. The disc flowers have dried up and, and dropped off here. Um, and that's true for all garyleums with the exception of this species, Garyleum bipinatum. In this fruiting head, you can see the, the ray floret fruits on the outside, and then these flattened fruits here developed from the disc florets. Um, the distribution of garyleum is centered in the summer rainfall regions of South Africa and Namibia. Um, and they often have very divided leaves. And then uniquely in the calendula, they um, mostly have these blue-violet ray flowers. Also um, unique to garyleum is this structure of the disc style, whereas um, here you can see the structures in the other calendula. The genus Calendula has about 10 species or more, depending on the taxonomy. And this is a Mediterranean centered um, genus. Its native distribution is in the Northern hemisphere around the Mediterranean, but there's a few widespread naturalized species. Um, and Calendula species have um, medicinal culinary and horticultural uses as illustrated here. There's Calendula extractor oil in a lot of um, creams and ointments and, and other products. In calendula, only the ray flowers produce fruit. So here's another picture of a fruiting head. Um, the disc flowers um, have um, withered and fallen off, but there's one, two, three different types of um, fruit that have been produced by the ray flowers. Um, and there's much variation in fruit um, structure in, in the genus calendula. The genus Dimorphotheca has about 24 species. And morphologically, the genus is characterized by these large, broad rays, um, which exhibit a range of colors, and by infoleucal bracts arranged in a single row. Dimorphotheca are also in the Macroland daisies because many species form a large part of these annual spring floral displays in that region of South Africa. Their distribution is Cape centered, so winter rainfall centered, with a few species extending into the summer rainfall areas of Southern Africa. And they're much used in horticulture where ironically enough, they're known as osteospermum. So an example here is these very beautiful spider forms with the ray florets twisted to create this rather unique shape. In Dimorphotheca, either both the ray and the disc flowers produce fruit. So here's a disc flower and these are ray flowers. So the species where both um, rays and discs produce fruit all these species where only the rays produce fruit and then they take on various forms, three angled forms like this, or uniquely in the calendula, in some species, only the disc flowers produce fruit and the ray flowers don't produce any. The largest genus in the tribe is Osteospermum, with about 80 to 100 species, depending on your definition. Um, and the current definition of Osteospermum now includes the former genera Trypterus, as well as Chrysanthemoides, Gibaria, and, and then a lot of other smaller um, genera. Its natural distribution is centered in the Cape and the Afrotropical zone, as shown here, all the way up um, Africa. And Osteospermum is characterized by having yellow or orange ray flowers and involucral bracts in two or th usually two, sometimes three rows. In Osteospermum, only the ray flowers produce fruit. Um, so you can see here um, fruits produced by the rays and the sterile discs and a huge variation in, in fruit structure is exhibited. So the fruits can be nut-like, they can be berry-like. Um, for example, the well-known um, Osteospermum monoliferum, the bitu bush or bone seed. Um, and these, these berry-like fruits are edible and dispersed by vertebrates, which probably contributes to being one of the most noxious weeds in Australia. But the fruits can also bear wings, like these three-winged fruits. Um, they can have air cavities. They can be spiny um, and or even have an eliosome for ant attraction. The modern taxonomic concepts of the calendula were laid down by Tycho Norland um, between 1943 and 1963 in a series of taxonomic studies, most notably his big monograph published in 1943. And he designated genera, subgenera, and sections based mainly on fruit characters, um, in particular whether the fruit develops in the ray florets, the disc florets, or both types of florets, and then the structure of those fruits. And you can see here some of his illustrations of different fruits. 
In his scheme, seven genera were recognized, Garyllium, Calendula, Chrysanthemoides, and the yellow represents all the different sections of Osteospermum, the small genus Gibaria, um, the small genera Crystallis and Dimorphotheca. And under his scheme, Dimorphotheca was very narrowly defined to only include those species that produced both ray and disc fruit as the name Dimorphotheca, two, two um, st fruit structures indicates. Um, Bertel Nordenstam then, um, also a, a Swede like Tycho Norland, contributed quite a few phylogenetic and taxonomic studies between 94 and 2009. Um, and he actually produced the first phylogenies of the tribe, which were morphological phylogenies. And then he added some um, DNA sequence data, he and his colleagues, culminating in this phylogeny that I'm showing here, which was published in the big Asteraceae book in 2009. Um, it includes, it's reported to include 47 taxa, but only 24 terminals are shown because many of the terminals are representative, um, for example, osteospermum pro parte or um, dimorphotheca, including some things, which makes it difficult to interpret because um, there's incomplete reporting of which exact taxa were sampled. But the main um, structure is clear, which is that this um, branch representing Garyllium is sister to the rest of the Calendulae. And then this clade here represents Dimorphotheca, including the genus Crystallis, and then the subsections of Osteospermum as well. Um, and then um, this clade here uh, houses Osteospermum, and the species come out in multiple different places. The same with Trypterus. There's Chrysanthemoides and Gibaria. And then um, um, Nordenstam also erected multiple small or monotypic genera to try and um, ensure monophyly of genera. But as this phylogeny demonstrates, um, that wasn't achieved. Um, so more on that later. I just um, uh, want to show you um, this graphic of Nordenstam's taxonomic scheme. So he expanded Dimorphotheca. So it's no longer defined in this narrow sense by um, fruits produced by both rays and discs. Instead, this broader concept of dimorphotheca is defined by ray florets, color and size, involucral bract arrangement and phytochemistry. So Nordenstam elevated many of Norland's subgenera and sections of osteospermum into independent genera and based on fruit structure. So his scheme ended up with 12 genera, but as I mentioned before, um, this is um, actually um, problematic because many of the genera are not monophyletic. Um, subsequently, there have been um, more taxonomic studies done, mainly some new species described in osteospermum and a, phylog uh, um, a taxonomic revision of Garyllium produced, but there have been no further phylogenetic studies of the entire tribe. In 2012, in the Cape Bl uh, Plant book, Manning and Goldblatt stated that this recognition of segregate genera on the basis of fruit adaptations is a hopeless endeavor. endeavor. Um, and they spoke about how many of these new genera, um, mono or oligotypic genera, just a few species, were described by Nordenstam in an effort to maintain monophyly of the existing genera. But the phylogenetic work show, here shows that Osteosperma and Trypterus are evidently still paraphyletic. The distinction between Osteosperma and chrysanthemoides was blurred by the discovery of a morphologically intermediate species. And there's also few morphological synapomorphies available to differentiate these genera. So to maintain generic monophyly, additional, even smaller genera will need to be erected, um, which could be problematic. So they propose an alternative, in their view, more useful treatment, which would be to expand the concept of osteospermum to include all taxa in the clade sister to dimorphotheca. So there's dimorphotheca. So the idea would be that all these taxa would be included in an expanded concept of osteospermum. So this is the Manning and Goldblatt scheme, much simplified. Garyllium is recognized in a much bigger osteospermum and then the broadened um, Nordenstam's concept of dimorphotheca. And we're continuing this work. So um, this is the Cape Calendula project team, um, myself and my colleagues at Sandby and the universities of Cape Town and Stellenbosch, and then a number of students. Robert Sadler is working on the phylogeny of the entire tribe. 
Babit Parker is focusing in on dimorphotheca. Lauren James will be focusing in on a section of osteospermum. And then there are several honors and MSc students who have been working on the reproductive ecology of um, calendulae. So I'm not going to show you the results of their work. I'll leave that for them to do, hopefully, at the next SAB. Um, but I'd like to show you a preliminary phylogeny that um, we put together based on DNA sequences of Gary Liam from Juanita van Sale's MSc thesis that she did with um, Maria Jackson. Uh, and then other sequences downloaded from GenBank, mostly. So this is a bootstrap tree, parsimony bootstrap tree, based on nuclear and plastid DNA sequences. Um, and you can see that, at least relative to these art groups, calendulae is recovered as monophyletic. Um, the genus Garulium is recovered as monophyletic, although there's not a lot of structure within the genus. And you can see these numbers here represent and multiple different accessions of a single species identified by numbers. And also there's strong support for garyleum being sister to the rest of calendulae as found by Nordenstam and Shallis show in their previous phylogeny. Um, Dimorphotheca is recovered as monophyletic in its expanded concept with the exclusion of this species, and I'll talk a bit more about that um, in a minute. Nicolas, the, sorry, you have, you have one minute remaining. Okay, thanks very much. Um, and then um, this is um, this large um, clade here represents um, osteosper there's an osteosperm sensu stricto clade and also a calendula clade, which is recovered as monophyletic. But this is very curious, this Dimorphotheca polyptera, because this species is, is a classic Dimorphotheca with both rays and discs producing fruit. So we found this very puzzling. It's well supported within this osteosperm clade. And we actually went out and sequenced um, more accessions. So in total, four accessions of the species were included from different populations across the range of the species, and they all came out in the same position. Um, and here you can see the, the species. And here are the ray fruit and the disc fruit, um, which was clear also on the type. Here's an image of the type specimen from the candle to in Geneva. You can see the flattened ray fruit, uh, disc fruit and the uh, winged ray fruit. Um, but unlike classic Dimorphotheca, um, which has these very broad expanded ray flowers, Dimorphotheca polyptera lacks that feature of Dimorphotheca, which might explain it. And we're certainly going to investigate now whether all these fruits do develop from, um, whether these fruits develop from the disc flower, or maybe if they are um, developing from ray flowers. Um, so, um, in terms of taxonomy, um, the way forward, I think, is to transfer Dimorphotheca polyptera to Osteospermum. Um, and so, our, this preliminary phylogeny at least supports the Manning and Goldblatt's um, generic circumscription um, with a broadened concept of Osteospermum. And as, as John has said, um, the advantage of this concept is that um, at the moment, this is quite poorly sampled phylogenetically. We're certainly adding to it, but but relationships within this clade might change. But if they're all in osteospermum, then that's going to promote taxonomic stability going forward. So um, I'll wrap up there just to say that um, about half of, in fact, more than half of calendulae species um, have been sequenced. And there's ongoing collection to improve sampling and investigate the taxonomy there. The phylogeny of Dimorphotheca is near complete. Thabit is, is writing that up for publication this year. We're continuing investigations into reproductive ecology. Ultimately, the aim is to revise Dimorphotheca um, and at least part of osteospermum. And there's several new species that we've discovered which um, we need to describe. So watch this space. And then just thanks very much for listening. And um, I'd like to acknowledge these individuals um, and organizations, and in particular, the Joan Wrench Fund um, for uh, student and intern funding. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. That's a, it's quite a lot of work that you are now putting all together. Um, there's one question from uh, Glenis. Thank you for the interesting talk. Any chance that Osteospermum portbergensis port might be a hybrid species. Yeah, that's that is possible, and I think that, that's something that would need to be investigated. Um, I think genetically as well as um, morphologically. 
um, yeah, that's that's that intermediate species between Chrysanthemoides and Anastiospermum that Dennis is talking about. Um, yeah, at this point we don't know, and I, and I think some um, perhaps genome size or karyological karyological investigations would also be useful in that regard. Okay. Are there any other questions? You are welcome to type it in the Q and A. Doesn't seem like that, but there's another question. Um, now, from my side, so you just uh, the three gene regions to compile that whole phylogeny. Um, what is it? ITS, ETS, and TNL, I think. It was yeah, it was it was ITS, but um, because we were, um, I mean, what I've shown you is just the preliminary work. So. Um, okay. we, we were relying on what was available on GenBank. So that was um, a lot of ITS sequences. Very few Calendulae have ETS sequenced on GenBank. So we, we haven't okay. um, incorporated those yet, although Robert is busy sequencing ETS to add more resolution. And Thalbit okay. has used ETS for the Dhamma for Pika phylogeny. But you're not um, considering maybe a, you know, like a genotype sort of larger approach instead of just single genes? Uh, that would be fantastic I and mean, i think that would require quite a bit more funding yeah that's usually the issue yeah, yeah okay yeah it doesn't seem like there's any other questions thank you for a very interesting talk um yeah it was very good to listen to thank you thank you okay so our next uh, presenter um angela do you think um abdul Wakil is now ready or shall we give him a uh, a chance at the end of the session. He is back. Um, let's just quickly do a, a mic check to hear that he's back successfully. Okay. So if you can just put your microphone on, Ajawo. Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Ezra's going to share the slides on your behalf, and then we will take. We'll proceed from there. Thank you. Can you see the slides? Thank you. Yes, I can see it. Thank you. Okay, just tell us which slide you'd like to continue from. Can we scroll for you? Yes, you can. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I think it's okay. Yeah. Perfect. Over no, to you. Fine, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is the summary of the morphology of the type section in course here. As you can see, within the type section in course here, the reproductive morphology and vegetative morphology are quite useful in separating the species. For example, looking at the inflorescence, in some plants, the inflorescence is shorter than the leaves, while in some, it is longer than the leaf. In some, it is umbel, while in some, it is axillary racing. In, so, in terms of number two, it varies greatly among the species of the type section in Cosia. Looking at the indumentum on the, on the, on the leaves too, in the case of uh, in Cosia, the nodes, the, uh, both adhesia surface and adhesia surface, uh, is uh, they are glandular. Why in why in uh, in Kosia Kuperi, only the adhesive surface is glandular. Those this all these character they can be used. They, they are used to to distinguish between the species of uh, uh, species in the type section in Kosia. Of course, characters such as stamen, pistil, and kill petals are less. They have less taxonomic value. Next slide. Next slide. Please. So this is the summary of the morphology of the type section in Kosia compared to the other section. It's the only species in the type section have uh, a kind of uh, standard pattern that can be glandular, that can be pubescent, and sometimes glabrous. But the under, in the other section, the standard pattern are consistently glabrous. Of course, they are also similar in terms of the habit, the type of inflorescence, which will be axillary or racing, and the presence of sculpturing on the kill petals. Next slide. So this is summary of the uh, repetition of the type section in Cosia. But the seven species are currently recognized, of which 18 of them have uh, erect or sub-erect. The meaning of 29 have trailing climbing of close stem. However, some some of the species, like in Cosia capensis, in Cosia codi and flaky, have a woody base, and they are also trailing, they also have a, or trailing habit. Many new lectospecies are proposed. In Cosia Argentia was found to be a, an homonym of a species from Angola. Hence, it was given another name, Rincosia Tumbengi. 
and Nicosia Caribaya was elevated was elevated to species level, and it now recognized as Nicosia Pocelli, and in, a number of synonyms were also made. Next slide. So we also described two new species, the Rincusia Nguenyi and Rincusia Watabagensis. Rincusia Watabagensis was seen among the collectibles, but it, it, it is distinguished from, from the Rincusia Sotabilis in that it has only one leaf. Of the species was described from using the Abirium specimen, but recently this uh, life species, life specimen was, was collected from water bag. And that is the only locality that the, that the species has been found. The other species that was described is Rincosia and Gwen. It was seen among the collection of Rincosia postiflora. Online Rincosia postiflora that is found in uh, Pumalanga province and Zuadi Sealand. This species, apart from being found in Pumalanga province, it's also found in, uh, in KwaZulu Nata. Another species that is yet to be described is the one that is found among the collection of Rincosia and Penteri. You can see the other species that is you not know, described have a kind of a densely packed in, uh, flowers compared to Rincosia penteri, and only one species have been seen. So that is why it's yet to be described. Next slide. So the second aim of this uh, presentation is to see whether uh, morphological and molecular data will support Baker classification. Recall that Baker classify uh, in 1923 classify Rincosia into five sections: as a phylum, chrysoscars. Polytropia, Sinospermum, and the five section Rincosia. So, the second objective is to evaluate the systematic position of the genus, especially with the closely allied genera Erosima and Bolisafra. Next slide. Next slide. So, standard procedure for, for DNA extraction, amplification, and sequencing was followed. Next slide. So here is the is the result from uh, plastic, plastic and nuclear uh, data set. So as you can see, the Rincosia is uh, paraphyletic in that the genome and also the, uh, the result, the, uh, the, this tree does not support Baker classification in that none of the section was retrieved monophyletic. You can see in you can see as you can see in the in group that contains Bolusafra, that group contains Bolusafra, Chrysostia, and Polytrapia and the type in Cosia, where the group D contains Sinospermo and Cosia. That means this molecular data, this molecular data does not support uh, Baker classification uh, in that none of the sectional sections was re was retrieved monophyletic. Also, the Rosima and Rincosia was also grouped together. Next slide. So here is the evolution of character. You can see this uh, is inflorescence type. Here, we could, in terms of inflorescence, you can see the the polysaphra and many of the sections, the other sections, they are mostly similar in terms of the inflorescence. And we don't have any kind of apomorphic character that can use to distinguish this, this species. Next slide. The same thing here, but the same the same thing we also we also found there. But you can see glabrous inflorescence could be like uh, a synapomorphic to that to that group at the, at the at the at the top of the tree. Next slide. Same thing with the number of flowers. The characters are shared by most of the species across the sections, uh, as well as the genera Eurosima, Bolusafra, and Incosia. So there is also not like a morphological character that can used to distinguish all this uh, section as well as the genera. Next slide. The same, with the, the same thing with the stem habit. Next slide. Here is the morphology of the of the of the Rincosia, the Erosima and the Bolisafra. Generally they are very similar when we look at their morphology. You can see the, the calis in all the in all the genera you can see the petals you can see the uh, you can see the standard petals and the and the other characters. They are very similar. So in terms of you can see so so now we can confirm that morphology and uh, molecular data actually support the relationship between the species. Next slide. 
So here is the conclusion. Morphological, molecular and morphological data indicate that Rincosia is not monophyletic, as you can see that it is paraphyletic, in that genera Bolisophora erosima are nested within the, within the genera. Also, phylogenetic tree of did not support Baker's classification, as none of the section was retrieved monophyletic. And you can see close relationship also exists between Rincosia arida, Capensis, Rincosia imaginata, Rincosia section, Chrysosia, and Polytrapa. Apart, apart, apart from that, they are similar morphologically. They are found in the they are, they are found in Cape in the Cape in the Cape. They are part of Cape Flora. They are all found in the in the Cape Town. Ancestral note consortium of selected morphology character revealed that they are they are significant overlap between general Bulisafra, Erosima, and Ecosia. Hence, there is no useful diagnostic apomorphy to separate the genera, which confirm close morphological similarity between them. So as you can see from the evolution of the character, that they are, they are, they are very close when, when we look at the morphology. And this is also reinforced by molecular data. So what is what the, so the way forward now, what we're going to do now, we, we, we believe that there is need for infra, new infragenetic classification between these uh, genera that belong to the Sokai Kajajine. And that is what we are doing next when we are able to uh, add uh, other gene region and the tree is, uh, is, is resolved. Next slide. So acknowledgement, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizer for the recognition fee wafer to attend this conference and uh, the other people who have helped me during the course of this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdul Wakil, um, for your interesting presentation. Are there any questions? I don't see any questions that's been typed as of now. Tell me, is this for a master's or a PhD study? A PhD study. Okay, so when are you planning to submit then? You know, I've already submitted. Well, okay, okay. Okay, yeah, hopefully. Yes, so um, I don't see any questions that you have there. I think the question that I have to ask is what's the way forward and you already answered that question. So um, if there are no questions from the floor, thank you very much and um, that we can eventually then listen to your talk. So thank you very much and best of luck for your research further. Thank you. Okay, so um, after all the poor connection issues, we uh, are actually still on time. So next up is um, Peter Bester um, with the topic in search of the true identity of Nemesia Vigilite. So Peter, you can share your screen and then uh, please continue. Yeah, for some other reason, he doesn't want to go back to the, to the, okay, can you see it now? Not yet. Let me just give it a second or two. There, something is coming up. Yes, please continue. We can see your slides. So thank you very much um, for this opportunity, um, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Before any proper conservation of a specific taxon can be addressed, the foundational knowledge of the circumscription of such a taxon needs to be well understood. To this end, a taxonomic study of the genus Nemesia is needed. And in today's presentation, I will be talking specifically um, under the title In Search of the True Identity, Identity of Nemesia Legulata. So, sorry, now it's not moving. Uh, recent studies on the Scrofularia AC show that the tribe Yemimeridae is the earliest branching phylogen phylogenetic lineage. This tribe consists of at least six genera, of which Diaschia and Nemesia are globally probably, probably the best known. If we look at some of the characters of the flowers, they are mostly aggregated into inflorescences and the individual flowers are highly zygomorphic. 
the corolla consists mostly of a somewhat fused lower lip and plus minus um, three upper lips and the upper lips is divided into two inner lobes and two outer lobes. Then at the mouth of the tube there is a, a raised um, hump uh, and that we call the palate. Some more characters of the, the genus is that plants are annual or perennial and mostly herbaceous. The leaves are linear to lanceolate and mostly toothed. Unlike most other members of the Scrophulariaceae, Nemesia um, has laterally compressed fruits. At the base of each flower stalk, um, the presence of uh, bract can be seen. There is a huge variation in fruit morphology, but surprisingly very, very little variation in the morphology of the seeds that can be seen in these um, smaller images in blue. One of the major taxonomic characters in the genus uh, that uh, is of yeah, taxonomic uh, importance is the morphology of the spur, which is the outgrowth of the corolla the general, uh, uh, the general morphology of the spur is usually a conical structure, straight downwards, um, uh, narrow at the tip, usually broader at the base of the spur, as you can see in the top two left images and the far right image. Then you get many species where this um, spur is elongated and curved to some extent and the bottom right you can see Nemesia caruensis where it is actually recurving. Other spurs like the one shown here has got an inflated tip and then there's also another group of, of um, spur types on the, the bottom right for um, images um, and these are called saccade or sac-like um, spurs, sometimes pointed like those two and right at the bottom they can also be very rounded. The last full revision was done by Hiren in Flora Capensis in 1904. Since then many new species have been described and nomenclatural changes has been published. It has thus been recognized as a genus in need of revision. The only published phylogeny was done by Dalton and his colleagues in 2008, but unfortunately this work did not include any samples of Nemesia legulata. Nemesia is an important as it is very vi widely cultivated, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. Due to the annual habit and variously colored flowers, plants easily hybridize. Plants are popular with gardeners as bedding plants and is used in baskets, window boxes and containers. Annually, many new species of hybrids are created, like uh, for example, the bottom left, plums and custard, is one uh, newly created hybrid. Most hybrids are derived from two of the natural species at the top left Nemesia affinis and the top right Nemesia stromosa. Um, Nemesia, Nemesia stromosa is also a threatened species known as Cape Jewels, um, mainly because of harvesting and destruction of their natural um, habitat. If we look at the conservation importance, 14% um, of the taxa in this genus is of conservation concern with 7% of those uh, in the threatened taxa categories and one species has already gone extinct. More than half of the species are of least concern with a few that is data deficient because of taxonomic reasons. So in this study, the basic methods uh, for, for um, taxonomic studies in a group was followed examining the protologue of the species, examining the type material, going out into the field and making observation in the same process, collecting DNA material, also herbarium specimens, examining specimens available both in the herbarium and on uh, JSTOR's uh, uh, online site, uh, doing mo uh, uh, morphometric measurements 
and eventually analysis of the data derived from these. So the problem with Nemesia is it seems that like there's a big um, state of confusion in terms of the circumscription of the taxa. Um, iNaturalist is a very handy um, tool that can be used by scientists, but this is just a word of caution. Um, late last year, I did an extract um, and the first um, 18 species or observations that came up in iNaturalist um, of Nemesia legulata are those shown on the, the screen. Um, if you actually look at the, the contribution, the, the images in those contributions, um, some of them actually could not be identified because you could not actually see all the, the characters needed for identification. And some of them where you could actually see the characters of, of this small sample set, most of those were actually wrongly identified. And out of these first 18 that appeared, there was none that was actually corrected, uh, identified corrected as legulata. It's not only on platforms like iNaturalist, but even Sanby's own red list plants show an image um, under the contribution of Nemesia legulata, which is actually a wrong uh, image or uh, it's not of that species. And a number of field guides also illustrate this uh, taxon with the wrong images. So not only there, but also in, in the herbarium, um, about 30% of the, the collections under the genus Nemesia has only been identified to species level. Um, so it just show what uh, big um, confusion there is, mainly because these um, flowers are very a three-dimensional um, in the live state and as soon as you press it a lot of the characters are lost. So that, that poses another problem in the um, study of this group. So Nemesia legulata was first described by George Bentham um, in the Botanical Magazine in 1836. Uh, he only cited one specimen from near the whole rev refer, um, a Dresch 3146C specimen. Um, in Flora Capensis during the last revision, Heeren stated that except the dilation at the tip of the corolla spur, the characters scarcely differ from those of Versicolor. And Heeren goes further to actually cite another specimen, Bolus 6488. Um, after investigation of this, these um, uh, specimens, um, it was actually a mixture of two different species. So since the last revision, uh, this species has been quite um, difficult to determine what the proper circumscription of it is. If we look at the type materials that was available on JSTOR, um, on the left hand side um, is a specimen from the same, from the type collection of Ligulata, a, a dress specimen um, indicated as the type of Ligulata. But in this image, you can see clearly see if we look at the, the spur, and I will show that later on, it is definitely not that taxon. Um, so this may, may, may be a case of a mixed collection that was made. On the right hand side is the Q specimen of the type and that actually um, is identical to the, the original um, uh, description of this taxon. So we are really, um, we know that that is probably the, the right um, concept for the species. If we look at uh, the, the types um, from Hamburg in Germany, um, on the left hand side, you can see that is the type, um, although it is indicated as the isotype, um, this conforms to our concept of the species as well. Um, and if we zoom into those flowers, you can actually see the spur is very broad and it's slightly um, inflated at the tip. And the spur is also laterally compressed. So this is the character that actually stands out in the identification of this species. And my collaborator, Dr. Um, Hubert, actually photographed these images 
on the side, um, a side view and also a view from behind to show the, the, the um, laterally compressed um, structure of the spur. Um, so at the bottom looking from, from the back and on the right hand side, another specimen from, from the same type um, locality of the original description, which is close to uh, Lutzville. If we look at the type in Stockholm in Sweden, um, there is very difficult actually to, to see on the material. Um, you can't actually distinguish between what is um, lobes, corolla lobes, and what is spurs. So it, it is difficult to use electronic images. But the type material that is housed in Missouri, at least on the middle top image, you can see the typical um, inflated at the tip, the spur, um, and also the, the, the flat spur. So Nemesia legulata, as we currently know it, is distributed on the western side of South Africa. It um, grows in sandy soils and forms small herbs annual herbs that we spout um, annually. On the right hand side you can see the, the bract, the floral bract, and that is very typical for this species. And on the left hand side you can actually see that large inflated tip of the spur and the laterally compressed um, spur um, containing some nectar as well. So there is a, a um, a variation in the expression of the spur in this species. So it can be sort of almost straight with the slight inflation, somewhat curved forward um, with a large inflation, sometimes very hairy, sometimes not. Um, so during the field work, we also observed, observed some specimens um, at the top right of uh, material that might indicate hybrid, hybridization in this case between um, Nemesia legulata and Nemesia um, macroceras. So the next few slides is going to be of, of um, species closely okay. related. Yes? You have about one minute, 10 seconds to finish. Okay, so I'll, I'll just show you a few of the species. So this is Macrocieras. So this has got a long um, spur that is pointed forward, but unlike um, Ligulata, this one is round in cross section. So it's not laterally com uh, uh, compressed. Um, and the other one is Nemesia calcarata, which has actually got a very straight spur going and it is at the base where it originates from the corolla, there it is much broader. So I'm just going to skip Ana Isucarpa, just on this slide, uh, if you remember the iNaturalist image, so most of those species that was wrongly identified as, as Legulata were actually this species, which is actually very uh, distinct with the straight conical spur and um, a zygomorphic fruit where the name Anisucarpa comes from. So I'm just going to skip those few slides. Um, Lisa is doing the phylogeny um, and the preliminary phy phylogeny at least uh, shows the legulatas that we regard as legulata to come out in the same clade and all of these other um, related species are actually spread throughout the tree. So to come back to my title, in search of Ligulata, so we have a concept that we base on the, 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 the type material that was collected, um, but we still have to study the related species and their protologues and type material um, to um, actually publish this work. I would like to acknowledge those people and organizations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, yes, I've also become, or oh, I've started to know Namesia. Um, just that I don't see any Q&A uh, questions there. Wait, there's one from Glennis. Hi, Peter, quite a challenge. The identity of this, spe uh, or the identity of the species. I hope you will assist in getting the right image into the Sandy Red List page. Um, that's likely the source of the incorrect IDs on iNatural. 
Um, yes. yes. Yeah. If I just can comment on that, yes. Currently, I think they actually pull up the images from iNaturalist. So, so that why yeah. So I, I will follow up so that that at least shows the correct taxon. Thanks, yeah, Glenis. So hopefully by the end of all of this, that will also be corrected. Then from Anli, hi Peter. Um, how many spur shapes occur in Namisia? Is spur shape related to pollinated type? Um, yes, I think in general the spur shape I think is related to pollinators. So those big saccate spades um, shape, for example, um, we have observed bees pollinating those flowers. Um, the conical shaped um, spurs usually have a very pronounced palate. So there is a mechanism where the pollinator actually have to go and sit on that palate and then it opens up the flower. Um, and I think there would be more um, like long tongue flies and so on, especially that caruensis that I showed with that curvature that probably impollinates those. I think that was part of the question. And um, the other part was how many shapes, um, as I showed in the one image with the four um, variations, so it's, it's very um, difficult. So, um, uh, Classically or historically, it was classified into three basic shapes in the key that he, uh, he and used: the, the conical one, and the saccate one, and then the saccate one with a with a tip, and the saccate one without the tip. So I hope that answers your your um, question, Anneli. Yes, I'm sure. Thank you. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, um, thank you very much, Peter, for your presentation. It's really beautiful flowers to look at and um, just to get a clear view on what's going on there. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is, um, let me just see, Angela said that everyone is online so we can go on I assume, is um, Jatra on the taxonomy and systematics of sections Compressor Gemate and Serisantia in the genus Miletia. So you are welcome to share your screen and uh, just let you know when that is visible. Right. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Um. There we go. Thank you. You may continue. All right. Um, all right. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you. The taxonomy and systematics of the African millet, millet, milletia. Oops. Can't go to the next slide. Uh, all right. So um, the tribe Miletiae is traditionally circumscribed, comprised over um, 43 genera and nearly uh, more than 900 species. <clears throat> it is predominantly pantropical and subtropical in distribution. The tribe is traditionally divided into three subgroups that there is um, Miletia and Tephrosia as, as the major components. Melantia uh, is uh, uh, has, uh, currently there are uh, more than 150 species of Melantia that are recognized. They are distributed across the uh, tropical and subtropical Africa, Asia, and Australia. And about five species are suspected to occur in the uh, North America, in California, and Mexico. However, these species are um, currently placed, uh, or they are traditionally placed under the genus uh, Hesperothamnus. Miletia was first described by Witt and Arnold for two Indian species, um, Miletia rubiginosa and uh, Splendid. Harvey uh, described 
two species in, in Africa, um, Miletia capra and Sudelandi, and these have since been moved to other um, genera. Uh, Dun uh, studied Miletia extensively and recognized 127 species, and he introduced the sectional classification where he, he described uh, 15 sections. Uh, the sections were predominantly distinguished uh, on characters pertaining to the presence or absence of the steeples, the, um, in, the petal indumentum, the base of the standard petal, and also other characters. Baker uh, further studied Miletia in tropical Africa and recognized 89 species in eight of the 15 sections uh, described by uh, Dun. His uh, sectional classification seemed to be similar to that of Dun. However, he uh, further added um, characters such as and also um, uh, calyx uh, lobes. Uh, Hesink further uh, studied Miletia and transferred several sections of Miletia to other genera, such as a uh, section U, U or Tri to genus Caleria, and also raised uh, section Bracteae to a, gen a generic level. Previous phylogenetic studies uh, in Miletia suggest that the genus is paraphyletic. The genus has also been found to be polyphyletic. However, this is based only on 12 of over uh, 50, 150 species of Miletia, uh, sampled only uh, the chloroplast and the uh, plastic genes. Uh, and, and these were only in eight of the 15 sections uh, found in, in, in Africa. It is therefore imperative to expand our scope of the work uh, to include as many African uh, species of Miletia as possible and also to explore other um, gene regions. This will improve our understanding regarding the phylogeny and the diversity of the genes. So Miletia is genetically and uh, phenotypically the most diverse compared to other uh, traditionally recognized genera in the tribe Miletia. The taxonomy of the genus remains poorly known, and the circumscription of the species is complicated by extreme morphological and generic variations, genetic variations. Sorry. Therefore, the aims of this study are to address the taxonomy and systematics of the genus in Africa and Madagascar concentrating more on the section com compressor gematai and ensel cantai. And in this presentation, I'm going to discuss uh, 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 taxonomic progress in the taxonomic revision of these two sections and also give an account, an account of the uh, Madagascan uh, group. So we started plant material from um, herbarium specimen housed in this uh, South African herbaria and also um, uh, material loaned from other international herbaria and also uh, uh, studied specimens from you know international herbaria that were available online. Uh, information uh, such as habitat, phenology and distribution was documented from herbarium sheets. We studied uh, online uh, resource JSTOR and also occurrence records also were downloaded from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility website. For our preliminary results uh, on section com compressor gematai indicate that the species, I mean the section is characterized mainly by uh, large trees. Uh, leaflets that are stipulate with uh, many parallel veins, flowers that are in terminal panicles and generally large, calyx lobes that are generally large, 
the petals that are serratious or sometimes glabrous, and the standard petal that is auriculate. Currently, there are about seven species that are recognized. So, uh, leaflets, corolla, and um, petal characters seem to uh, assist or, or assist in distinguishing uh, these species in the section to some extent. For example, the, you can see the variation of the uh, leaflet pairs across the species in the in the uh, in the section, and also only uh, one species, Mulatia uh, versicola, that has. Uh, uh, he suit uh, corolla and also petals that are serratious. So in terms of distribution, this section is mainly distributed in the central and, and eastern Africa with one species, uh, Miletia stolmani, that extends further south to South Africa, to the northern parts of, of South Africa in, in Zimbongo. There's also um, one species in the section that is endemic to the far eastern uh, regions of Tanzania, uh, Miletia cycloxi. Uh, coming to section Serecanthae, it is characterized by erect trees and or shrubs. The leaflets are with or without sepals. Racemes are axillary or occasionally terminal. Flowers are in clusters and uh, petals are serratious and also the standard petal is um, exorolate compared to the uh, section compressor gemati where the, the standard petal was auriculate. There are about uh, 22 species that are recognized in this section. The section is widely distributed, you know, across east, uh, central, and uh, further east, I mean, further west to west, uh, to uh, countries such as Guinea and Sierra Leone in, in, in West Africa. So, uh, section Serecanthae and, and Compressor Tumatai uh, this, the distribution of the species uh, highly overlaps, and it complicates, uh, you know, the it complicates the, the, the species delimitation since also there is a great morphological variation over this uh, uh, over these species, and also what's uh, most challenging also is the nomenclature in these two sections. So it's a huge challenge, and uh, you know, mostly uh, uh, specimens are either uh, uh, poor, uh, they, are, they are in very poor condition, or species are under collected. And uh, the most of this uh, of the collections in this section, you have specimens that look like this, which, you know, further complicates the, the, the taxonomic issue in this, in this, um, in the genus. So the Madagascan group is quite um, distinct. Um, they are characterized by deciduous trees that are often very large, um, up to 30 meters tall. Uh, the leaflets they are without sepals, and their pairs they range from a five uh, to to twenty five pairs. Um, racemes are axillary, or um, they their flowers are in pseudo racemes. Uh, their flowers are either in clusters or they are solitary. The standard petal is serratious. Sorry, the petals are serratious, and the standard petal is cuneate, and Currently, there are about seven species that are, are recognized in, in, in this group. Uh, most of the species are widely spread, you know, across uh, the, the island. And uh, there is one species that seems to be uh, more widespread than the other, um, Miletia richardiana, 
it's more widespread. And we also have some of the species that are, are quite uh, limited to the coastal uh, areas, uh, for example, uh, Miletia orientalis. For uh, species in each of these sections, similar and seemingly closely related, and which uh, complicates uh, species delimitation throughout um, uh, the, 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 these sections. Section Seracanthi possible contains less than uh, 22 species based on the distribution, there, there are so many species that overlap and, and, and morphology as well. Species from Madagascar are endemic and they present some distinct characters. For example, uh, they are the only species um, that you know, has trees that grows up to uh, 30 meters tall and they are the only group also that has uh, leaflet pairs that you know range up to up to 25 uh, pairs, and therefore they can possibly form a, a new section. However, this is pending on the molecular on the results of the molecular data, which I'm currently busy uh, working on. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my supervisor for her guidance and also curators of all the herbaria for um, availing material to us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tulisile. Um, are there any questions? Here's one from uh, uh, Stephen Boatwright. Given the uh, Polyphyly of Miletia, how confident are you that these sections are monophyletic? Will this be tested? Yes, um, I am still working on the uh, molecular studies. So this will be uh, confirmed after the results of the, of, of the uh, molecular studies. I hope that answers your question. Yes. So I was about to ask about the phylogeny, um, the results that you've gotten so far with morphological characteristics. Can you see any correlation with the phylogeny as yet? Or is it at such a stage where you can't make any conclusions yet? No, based on the you know previous studies on, on, on the phylogeny, at this stage, um, I, I cannot decide at all. Is this for and PhD also, study? Yes, and also the fact that you know the, the previous morphological, I mean, uh, phylogenetical studies were only based on uh, twelve uh, species in the region. So, um, yeah, too little. Yeah. Okay. So, if there aren't any other questions. Thank you very much for your presentation and uh, best of luck for your, for your uh, research. And to Thank you this. so much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so the last presentation in the session and for today, um, last but not least, I say, is Arifa um, Yakut. So she will, her topic is systematics of Cotilla, reflections and challenges of working on a cosmopolitan genus. Arifa, are you here? Hi. Yes. Okay, you just there you uh, can share your screen. Uh, froze. Just give it a second. Okay. We still have some time. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, it's coming up. Yes, thank you. You can continue. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Alpha, and I'll be speaking about the systematics of Cotula, reflections and challenges of working on a cosmopolitan genus. Okay, so species from the genus Cotula are mostly found in Southern Africa, but there are some species that occur in Australia, 
um, Asia, Northeast Africa, and Central America. That's closely related to the South American genus Saliva and the Australian genus Leptinella. The close relationship of these three genera, three genera have been discussed by several authors over the years, and this is due to the fact that they have similar morphology. Also, the, um, one of those um, characters is that many of the species in these three genera have these disc-like flower heads, as you can see over here. And because of this, they, many of the species from these genera have the common name uh, button daisies. Okay, so looking at the latter two genera, these two genera are clearly defined and have these species concepts resolved. And they have uh, comprehensive revisions done in the 1900s. And they're circumscribed using some morphological characters. And for example, uh, this is one of the characters of Latinella. It's looking at the disciform floret, and the character is the presence of this corolla on the disciform floret. And this is said to be unique to uh, this genus. And look at saliva, one of the characters over here is also the discipline floret, and it has the, the presence of these um, spiny appendages, as well as the style that persists as a spine. I'm looking at cochula. Cochula is not clearly defined. It's never been revised in its entirety, but there has been a, a treatment of the South African species in 1964. And since then, there have been uh, two comprehensive revisions done. And this is uh, on two informal groupings that consist of about seven species each. Uh, the first was in 2014 on the Cochula coronobifolia group, and the second was on the Cochula turbinata group in 2019. So as Cochula is not clearly defined and Leptinella and Saliva are, if a new species comes along and it lacks characters that Leptinella has and Saliva has, it would be placed in uh, the Cochula genus. But uh, when we investigated and looked at all the uh, cochula specimens, we noticed that the that all the morphological characters that we use to circumscribe both Leptinella and Saliva, those characters are actually also um, present in cochula species. And this blurs the lines of the circumscriptions um, of these genera. So why is there a need for a cochula division? Uh, revisions in general are vital for species conservation as they directly impact policy, conservation, assessment, and management. And in the revision of the Cochula coronobifolia group, they included the redness assessment of these seven species. And they found that 67% of the redness assessment for species in, the, in this group were incorrect. And this was uh, mostly due to um, species misidentification. So with, even with cochlear being so um, not clearly defined, it's also in the phylogeny um, part. So for example, in Himmelreich's uh, Leptinella phylogeny, Leptinella and Saliva are quite well represented, where only six out of the 49 cochlear species were represented. So part of my PhD is to expand on the sampling of cochlear. The rest of the aims of my PhD are to explore genetic relationships and circumscriptions between these three genera and to revise the genus Cochula. Uh, but the aims of this presentation, however, is to introduce new intergenetic uh, classifications for Cochula in the broader sense and to highlight some of the main findings and challenges. So the of the method for the taxonomy field investigation was done. More than a thousand herbaria specimens were examined and nomenclature was compiled. With the DNA sequencing and an analysis, uh, DNA was extracted, amplified, and sequenced. Three markers were used, two placid and one nuclear. Sequencing alignments were done using MEGA, and two types of phylogenetic trees were reconstructed, a Bayesian tree and a maximum parsimony tree. Okay, then look at some of the results. This is the majority rule consensus tree. This is a combination of the ITS and placid trees in the tree. And we included 88% of the total uh, uh, a number of cochlear species and a sampling of Leptinella and saliva taken from a hemorrhagic study. So we see that Leptinella is only monophyletic when including cochlear alpina, and the and Leptinella clade, this entire clade, is embedded within cochlea. We'll see that saliva is only monophyletic when including cochlear mexicana. And we see cochlea is paraphyletic with four main clades. And it's not surprising that cochlear is paraphyletic as it's um, not clearly uh, defined. 
the question is now what to do with these three gender. We explored multiple options and weighted the pros and cons of each of the options and came up with one solution with the least amount of disruptions. And that is to make one genus and to circumscribe this on the bilaterally symmetrical capsali that are dorsally flattened as well as the presence of only two vascular bundles in the pericarp. So cochlear will be expanded to include uh, cochlear mysticines as well as leptinella and saliva. And then two subgenera will be recognized, subgenus cochlear and subgenus saliva. We recognize subgenus saliva as it has quite distinct um, morphological characters as well as biogeography. And looking more at cochlidus, I mean, at subgenus saliva. There are about seven species in the subgenus with uh, only six combination new names required. We can add some of the morphology. Uh, we found a new synapomorphy syna for the subgenus. All the receptacles of species in the sub, uh, subgenus has these long hairs present, as you can see up there. There are also additional characters that are used uh, to group these species together, such as the spiny appendages. Also, these species are all native to Central and South America. Looking at subgenus Cochula, there are about 90 species in the subgenus, with only one new species um, requiring a name. And this is due to the fact that many of the species in the subgenus were previously um, sectioned within Cochula. Um, so they were moved from Cochula to Leptinella and now back into Cochula. Okay, and looking at some of the characters, there are some characters that group these species together, as well as the discard having these four lobes. As you can see over here, it, it has a wide distribution with most of the species occurring in Southern Africa and some occurring in, uh, and um, a lot of them also occurring in Australia. This uh, subgene is quite variable and a surprising amount of uh, floral diversity. And as you can see over here, this is just some of the seeds of only some of the species. And you can see it's quite diverse. Yes, so subgenus Cochula will be divided into sections. And all these sections are monophyletic and have uh, morphological characters um, to back up these sections. So um, there are eight sections that are reinstated and 12 new sections will be introduced. So just looking at some of the sections, uh, I'll be looking at the clade, um, the formerly known uh, Leptinella species, or the Leptinella clade. So historically, there were three sections within Leptinella, and they only had morphological characters um, to define each section. But when plotting these, morph uh, these sections onto our phylogeny, we see that only section is monophyletic and the other two are not. So we'll be uh, redefining these sections to be monophyletic. You can see up there. So we'll be uh, reinstating uh, three of the sections and we'll be introducing four new sections. We modified the morphological characteristics for the reinstated sections, as you can see over here. And we came up with new morphological characters to um, define the new sections. And just looking at some of the uh, Southern African cochlear species, as there's not a lot of time, I'll just be looking at one of the sections. I'll be looking at the section over here. And all the species within this um, section have the same type of, uh, have the same morphological characters. They all have the leaves um, at the base of the plant with these naked peduncles and this disc flower heads, as you can see over there. Also, there's some distribution. And um, a new species was described, but was, this was after the tree was already constructed. But this new species has all of the morphological characters listed over here, as well as similar distribution ranges. So this new species, Cochlea tuberculata, will be placed in uh, this new section uh, based on these um, characters. So this makes uh, the sections largely uh, predictive, as only 88% of the uh, cochlear, uh, total thumb of cochlear species have been included. It's easy uh, to place the remaining um, species into sections. Okay, so even with all the challenges facing, uh, that are faced making all the sectional changes, 
there were additional challenges of working with such a large group. Uh, one of the other challenges was the insufficient material um, acquired of the widespread species to represent the full diversity globally. And there are about six of these widespread cochlear species. I'll just be concentrating on three of them, Cochlea australis, Cochlea anthemoides, and Cochlea hemispherica. When looking at Cochlea anthemoides and Cochlea australis, you can see there's some overlap in the distribution. Um, you can see in Asia there's some overlap and in um, Southern Africa. Um, I've not acquired uh, any material from Asia, um, but what I've noticed in uh, Southern Africa is that these two species are mistaken for each other, and this is evident on iNaturalist as well as on herbaria specimens. And uh, this, could, this is due to the fact that they have never been compared to each other. There's never been a revision of these um, that in, uh, or treatment that included these two um, species. But when we actually look at the morphology of these two species, we actually see they're quite different from each other. Cochlea australis um, has multiple, C, uh, three to four series of these discipal florets in the outermost series, where Cochlea anthemoides has about six. So looking at the discipal florets, we see that Cochlea anthemoides has corolla present, which is absent on Cochlea australis. Um, also, the trichomes are quite different between these two species, and there are some other characters um, that can be used to distinguish these species from each other. And then when we look at the phylogeny, we'll also see that these two species are not related. And then looking at Cochlea anthemoides and Cochlea hemispherica, as you can see over here, both of these species occur in um, Asia. But no, um, I have not re have not acquired any Cochlea hemispherica uh, material from any of the global herbaria from which I have loans. Um, but what I've seen from the type material is Cochlea hemispherica is most likely not a synonym, synonym of uh, Cochlea anthemoides. And ultimately the question is, is Cochlea hemispherica a Cochlea or not? So this is apparently a new record of Cochlea anthemoides uh, in India. And um, after examining this paper, we realized that this isn't Cochlea anthemoides at all. It's not even um, from the genus Cochlea. It's from a completely different genus. And this just highlights the need for a global revision of Cochlea. So in conclusion, Cochlea will be expanded to include Liptonella, Saliva, and uh, Cochlea in the strict sense. Two subgenera are recognized. Sectional classifications uh, are introduced for subgenus Cochlea, and this will be based both, both on morphological and phylogenetic evidence. Uh, 20 sections will be recognized in subgenus Cochlea, 8 are reinstated, and 12 new sections. Combinations required uh, for only 7 species out of the 97 uh, species in the genus Cochlea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arifa. That was really a well, well structured um, presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Um, let me just see any um, questions. Glennis, um, were there separate plastid and nuclear phylogenies congruent? Um, yes, in most cases there was one incongruency, but otherwise um, everything else was congruent. Yes. Okay. And um, are you? I, I didn't see on the slides, but were you using the uh, uh, combined? Obviously, yes. A, yes. a combined IPS and plastic region three. Yes. Okay. Yes. Are there any other questions? It's that time of the day where everyone just <laughs> wants to go. <laughs> yeah. So I just I, I can't remember whether I've seen this, but which gene regions did you use? Ooh, um, uh, to, ooh. <laughs> why can't I get to the names? Um, I think it's five to four A, and then for the, uh, I can't get to the names. Um, some turn L or turn L F or some near. Um, just see okay. <laughs> get to it. Um, oh, turn C, bit N, and PSBA, turn H. Okay. Yeah. 
Then there's some comments from Janine Victor. Great work, Arifa. And Lauren James says, a very interesting presentation and well presented. I agree very much. Okay, so that seems to be um, the end of the session and the end of today, I, I assume. So thank you very much to everyone who attended um, the session. Then um, we'll continue again tomorrow morning. So enjoy the rest of your, your day and your evening. Bye-bye.